everybody and welcome back to the EC Method podcast. I am one of your coaches, Chloe Maidley. And I am your other coach, Emma Story Gordon. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome. We've had some audio issues in the last few episodes. We're hoping that this one's better for you guys. Um, And I suppose what we should probably preface this with saying is that for all of our online clients, uh, we've got our graduates and we've got our newbies. So people who are new to the program, people who've done it. Um, And obviously it is now Monday. So we have a week of results under our belt. Woohoo. Uh, And the first thing that I would like to do is address uh, those people who did have great significant losses or even just mental shifts in week one, which is fantastic. And those people who didn't see any losses. And obviously, uh, I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg or whether they weren't feeling any mental shift before that, if which would be reflected in how they they're reacting now that they haven't seen any losses on the scale or if the lack of the loss on the scale has just shifted them into a really negative mental space so to everybody that lost absolutely fantastic you do not need to change anything you are on the right track you are losing and as emma and i always say you will not lose mega amounts every week especially week one it is likely that for a lot of you it will be your biggest loss and um, that does not mean that the second that you slow down you have to change anything we want you to wait for at least two weeks ideally three And if you really are plateaued, then we can talk about dropping your calories, increasing your step count, adding some time onto your training. But we are doing that latter point for you as you get the training plans as we go. But massive well done. And the shift in mental attitude, I think, this week has been, with a lot of you, has been phenomenal. And exactly what Emma and I want to achieve as coaches. Emma, what do you think? Do you have a message for the people who've who've had some great achievements? Yeah, I think some people have seen great results already, which is amazing. But also don't, this is the one like potential downside of the group is that comparison is the thief of joy a lot of times. Like you can either say, oh, I lost a pound and I was really happy with that. But then I went on the group and saw that so-and-so had lost four pounds. And the thing is like, we're probably seeing in the group the people that have done really well. So don't like, don't compare yourself to them because I'm sure there's a lot of other people who have maybe not lost this week or yeah, who haven't seen that drop yet. And so many people are still so fixated on the scales. It's been such a short amount of time. And Mm. just to give a really quick example, if you're someone who gains about three pounds the week before your period starts, I do. Then if you've lost one pound of fat this week, which would be your typical like textbook, one pound of fat is a good way to go. It means that you've been in roughly a 500 calorie deficit on average each day. That's 3,500 calories that equates to about one pound of fat and energy. So if you've lost one pound of fat, you would still be two kilograms heavier if you're in that week before your period. That's why we try and make you not look at the scales too much and not give them, like that isn't your only marker of success. That's why we always want you to focus on the process. If you have hit your calories this week, if you've got at least three workouts in this week, if you've got your steps count on average this week, that week is a win for you. It doesn't matter what the scale says. And there is no physiological way that if you do all those three things that you won't lose weight. And you might be thinking like, oh, what if I, you know, like what if I don't burn as much as someone else? Like the reason we've set you or that we encourage you to do your steps and hit 10,000 steps or 12,000 steps is because then we kind of know what your energy expenditure is going to be. We know that if you're hitting your 12,000 steps and doing your workouts, and sticking to your calorie target, you will be in a deficit. Like it's not, that side of it gets way over complicated. We know that you're in a deficit if you do those things. It doesn't Mm. matter what the scale says. So, and also it's been one week. Like I see a lot of people like, oh, I want to change this and this. No way, no one is changing anything until two weeks. No way. That, that was all I had to say. Thank you. No, it's, I think uh, uh, amazing. And I, I'm completely on board with everything you've said. And I also wanted to address the people who have not lost this week. Now, if you are on a higher end of a deficit, I'm talking like 1800 calories, right? And nothing has changed, nothing has shifted. In an ideal world, I kind of want you to stay put for another week. However, if you're like, look, this is quite a lot of food for me. Um, I know that I can go lower. I know I've dieted before and seen success on my numbers. Absolutely fine. Drop it a bit. That's completely fine. It 
is not a coincidence that there is a group of you that either haven't lost or have even seen the scale sh trend up a little bit who have come in to the EC method having been on crash diets of 1800 of 800 calories a day um, or, or kind of like that bracket usually goes up between 800 to 1200 calories a day. Emma and I do not want you to start our coaching plan on those low calories. There is no reason why you should ever be there unless you are a physique athlete and even then it would be for the tiniest period of time right before a, a shoot or a show day it is not for the gem pop to be on those calories and certainly not for weeks months potentially on and off for years at a time it's ridiculous okay it's completely inappropriate and what's going to happen is you're going to well you will have already flawed your metabolic rate because your metabolism will adapt downwards and when you go into onto crazy extreme calories like that your body will try and conserve energy and it will try very very hard to stop you losing anything else okay so we don't want you to stay there forever which means what we slowly and gradually have to increase your calories to get you to a healthy point and what that means is you might stay stable you might not lose anything you might gain something that's fine we want to work your metabolism up we want to stop making the problem worse stop completely and utterly taking any and every opportunity of success with your body away from you which is what's going to happen when you stay on those calories and we want to start you afresh and we want to start you at a good healthy standpoint so then you can go into it then you can get some good results okay we as emma said the things you need to take into account are your bmr which is what i've just talked about okay so that's how, if you're not losing, it's because you flawed it, okay? The second thing, your need, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. As Emma said, if you're hitting 10 to 12,000 steps a day, you're getting your need in, okay? We know that that is going to increase your metabolic rate. That's great. Your EAT, your exercise activity thermogenesis. As I said, Emma and I are handling that. Every week, we will help you progress. We will add on time here and there. We'll add on intensity here and there. We will keep you progressing. Um and lastly, muscle mass. One of the girls yesterday was upset because she said the reason why she thinks that she hasn't lost anything is because she's used to doing hit circuits and this is more body strength stuff. This is hit circuits with body strength. The more you use your muscle, and ideally the more you grow your muscle, which is quite hard to do with just body strength unless you're brand, brand new to it, in which case you might the higher your metabolic rate will climb, the more you can eat and continue to lose fat, okay? So you, please, will you just trust Emma and, us, tr and, and I, sorry, will you trust the process? Tag us if you're worried, but please listen, because I said a lot of this stuff yesterday, I did a big old post on it, woke up this morning, the same people saying the same things. Please trust us. I know it might, this is going to sound really harsh. We do know better than you. We just do. So you don't know better than us. So please listen to us. Absolutely, your body is your body, and we are not in it. And I get that, and that is accurate. But let us help you through it and listen to our answers. And that is what I will say. Okay, excellent. Right, I think that has been a good Rant. intro. <laughs> we feel refreshed. I think it, it just, mm -hmm. and like we've even had this in a lot of the. So I've gone through everyone's self assessments and and the questions at the side well we both have and a lot of the things that are coming up like even people are noticing like you guys are doing so well at answering the same questions again and again and again and it is frustrating when it's really mundane things like we are here to help you when you get stuck but if it's things yeah. like does it matter how many fats and carbs we have like we've spoken about that in every single podcast so far and there's still questions about it and we can teach as much as you will listen and learn like we're here for you to help you and like and we noticed this last time like at the start you get these sort of questions about just should I train on this day or like quite mundane questions but as we go through the questions get better and better and better because you're thinking about more yeah. things but really these yeah. ones like they're written in the group they've been answered in the group they've been answered on every single podcast so now you should know these things yeah, okay. agreed. Actually, can I just add one thing? If we are saying this stuff specifically about the scales, if we are telling you these facts and we're telling you what to do and they're in the announcements and they're on the podcast and it is still going in one ear, out the other, you need to throw the scales away. The scales are not a good measure of progress for you because you're not taking on what we're telling you, which means you're going to throw in the towel and give up. Get rid of the scales enough. I don't want, I don't want anybody who's read or heard this and still feels upset by them to carry on weighing in you're done no more scales for you okay <laughs> the scales have been taken away from you right i have divided some of these questions into quick fire answers chloe which i want you to answer within 20 seconds fine fine Are you ready? <laughs> yeah okay 
Number one, what are your thoughts on massage guns and Shakti mats? Basically, spiky mats for muscle mats for muscle pain. I've got one of them actually. It's meant yeah. to be. I think it's meant to um, be like lying on the bed of nails or whatever. It doesn't do anything, but it's quite interesting. I think it can. I, James, my husband, is a professional athlete. Has loads of injuries, loads of DOMS. Um, really fucked up body. He swears by this stuff. He feels like it really gets in there, like really kind of pounds his muscle fibers and makes him feel uh, more mobile afterwards. I'm kind of in the same school of thought as Emma. I think uh, mobility is great. Stretching is great. It might be a really nice pain that might have maybe kind of like a placebo effect and make you feel a bit better. But I'm not a hundred percent sure that they're going to solve all of your DOM tastic problems. Okay, my thoughts on this, because I, I have both of them and I've tried both of them. I think massage guns are good if you're someone who requires a lot of sports massages or you've got like ongoing injuries or tightness. And like, I think they are pretty good at doing that. So anyway, massage gun, potentially, yes, useful. That mat with the spiky things, um, I find it useful. Like I cannot meditate. I don't know about you, but I just start thinking about other stuff. Whereas if you have a slight bit of pain, you almost like get in a really good meditative state because you're just thinking about that pain and then that pain sort of eases as you lie there. I don't know. I enjoy it for that, but I don't think for muscle pain it's going to do much help. Okay, you ready for the next one? Yeah. Just wanted to ask how important it is to eat after workout. I've never been a huge morning eater and never hungry until about 11, 12. I have a coffee and water around 6 a.m., workout around 7. I find it hard to eat after, so will have will this have a bad effect on my recovery slash results if I wait till I'm hungry at about 11? hope that makes sense. Yeah, so we've spoken about this quite a few times before. Uh, definitely go back and listen to the previous podcast because you'll probably get a lot of good, good stuff from them. Um, Look, the anabolic window, it's been proven that it's a lot longer than people think. Some people are like, get in your protein and carbs right after your workout. Like, don't panic, okay? You actually have a few hours to get it in. Um, all we would say is the closer, the closest that you can get it in as soon as after you've worked out, when you feel hungry, we don't want you forcing food down yourself, the better, the better for recovery. Um, and also just the better use of calories, right, in your body. So as soon as you can, eat do but don't panic if you're not feeling hungry for an hour or two after your workout that's very normal and that's fine emma um yes i would so i would agree with this during the day but i just feel like if you've like you've effectively fasted the whole time you've been asleep you're getting up you're doing your workout fasted fine i would prefer i mean as chloe's saying like it's not essential will it make real world significance like significant difference potentially not but I would prefer that you got in some protein after that workout like bearing in mind you've just been fasted for probably 10 hours and then you're going to train and then you're going to so ideally yeah if it if you're just really not hungry and you don't enjoy it then it's not the end of the world but if you were looking for optimal results yeah I would probably try and get something in quite soon after okay this one isn't a quick fire one or I've not written that it is for some reason. So having listened to your podcast backlog, when you are increasing calories after the deficit, um, you don't increase protein calories. Why is that? Um, we recommend a stable protein intake of, uh, Emma always says bare minimum of 100 grams. I'm in agreement with that. Uh, anywhere between that and 150 is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Or if you want to be really specific about it, two grams per one kg of lean body mass. Um, so that's your body mass without the fat. So if you're, you know, if you know that you're heavily overweight, that is not going to be the body mass on which you should be basing your macros on. Uh, but it will typically look like somewhere between 100 to 150 grams. Um, you don't need to eat more protein than that. Your body can only use so much protein, dietary protein at any one time before essentially you're talking about wasted calories. And that typically will be anywhere between 30 and 50 grams in a, is a great bracket to aim for. But anywhere beyond that, you your body uh, it's really got no use for it. Um, so we think that's a great way to, uh, a great number to aim for and to break it up throughout the day to keep encouraging muscle protein synthesis um, and kind of uh, negate the effects of muscle protein breakdown, both of which will occur naturally in your body always, okay? Um, 
So that's why you don't need to go beyond that. You don't ever need to increase protein. And that's why we never want you to drop down under that because then you're not getting enough. So it should be a pretty blanket thing. When it comes to refeed days, diet breaks, things like that, the idea is that you, in an ideal world, increase predominantly via carbohydrates as that is your body's preferred energy source. You're going to have better training sessions. You're going to recover better. And you're probably going to feel more satiated as well because that's where you're going to get a lot of whole grains and fiber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and then and then we're off to the races back into a deficit again, pulling from fats and or carbs, probably carbs. Um, and that it really is how I would articulate it. Emma. OK, so the reason that we don't increase your protein calories is that, as Chloe was saying, we're so, we've sort of saturated that response. The other thing is now that you're like, let's say you're coming up to maintenance or even in a slight surplus, you're not in this anabolic breakdown state anymore. So it's more likely that you will build muscle anyway and you've got the building blocks there from that protein. But you don't necessarily need more of that. And because it's so essential and because we want you to maintain muscle mass, like I sometimes have people who are dieting on more protein than I would at, at them at maintenance or in yeah. a surplus. So that's sort of why you're less likely to break down or be in a negative energy or negative protein balance at the end of the day when you're not in a calorie deficit. So there's less need to increase protein. On a practical level as well, protein is expensive and some people really struggle to get in just 100 grams. So really trying to push them up. One, there's no need. Two, it's mega expensive. Three, sometimes if you're really trying to be in a bit of a surplus and build muscle, you just get full. And then I would say three, like the environmental impact of eating a lot of protein is quite negative as well. I think we should all probably take a little bit more responsibility for that. So those would be my reasons. She also says, which you are going to love, Chloe, the scale fluctuations is a bloody revelation and it's made my relationship with that number so much healthier. Yes, gal. Yes, well done. Well done. Thank you. We're so, we're so happy with that. I would just also like to say that this week I've been fluctuating from 60 kg to 64 kg, sorry, last week, and every single day was a different number in a 4 kg bracket. And I know that my fat loss phase is going really, really well because all my clothes feel looser and I can feel my waist getting smaller. Please take it from me. The scale is not an accurate measure of fat loss. I continue. <laughs> Thank you for that interlude. Uh, okay, struggling with the equipment um, and having weights at home so far. Few... Okay, sorry, this is a very long-winded question okay just take mm. a second to skim through it and summarize yeah. <laughs> she says at the end not sure if this is a question but any advice would be appreciated yeah it doesn't seem like a question if you i think she's up. basically asking like she doesn't find training on her own very motivated motivating and she finds someone telling her what to do more, that spurs her on more yeah that's pretty would, normal yeah I think it's normal and I think a lot of people including probably us are finding it quite hard to get motivated at home but I'm and I think we always say this but you can't rely on motivation like if, if you only train when you really want to train like if I didn't train any days that I felt like I probably didn't want to do it I would get barely any results especially now I'm at home like most mornings I don't really want to train but I get it done and I know I'll feel better after it yeah and I think it's just about that like it's suck it up and do it yeah that's the key get I would say get it done early doors in out over the longer that I wait throughout the day the harder and harder it gets and Emma's right if I you know we're, we're professionals in the field and if I only trained on the days where I wanted to train I would train maybe three days a week max James would train never <laughs> ever <laughs> So you just get up, you get it done because it's good for your body. You probably want to feel better in your own skin psychologically. And, and just it, it's just it, just get up, get it done, tick the box and crack on with your day. OK, here's a good one. I'm really worried about the next few weeks. I'm normally pretty good for two or three weeks and then I tend to get a dip in motivation and I just feel useless again. I know that I need a mindset shift and I feel that the online group is really helpful for that. But how do you avoid the dip? 
Um, I think, uh, again, that's really, really normal. I think it's about setting yourself new goals every week. So say if in, and, and that for me is how I stay on track. If I don't set myself a new goal every single week that I'm in a fat loss phase, but sometimes I think the longest one I've done is like 19 weeks, which is a long time, right, to be on a diet. If I don't set myself a goal every week, it gets very monotonous and it gets very boring, 100%. So whether it could be a weight loss goal, it could be a, but we know we've discussed, we've discussed how erratic the scales are. So if you're going to do that, please do it with a pinch of salt. Uh, it can be a, a steps goal. It can be a performance goal. A lot of Emmy's workouts that, I mean, I mean, I have no qualms in admitting everybody loves Emmy's workouts way more than mine because they're so good, like mentally, like really, like the, the she basically just gives you reps and it's up to you if to try and beat your time mm. or try and try and see if you can get like maybe an aesthetic result in the mirror that you haven't seen yet. Nothing mental, like, you know, you're not, not going to get shredded in a week, but something you haven't seen yet that you'd quite like to see on yourself. Um, as I said, an added step count or, you know, a, a, a lost inch somewhere. Just try and give yourself a new goal every week, every Monday morning and maybe write it. We've got like um, like white whiteboard sheets that you put on the wall. And every week I write out my cardio. I write out my calories, my macros, and I write out a goal. And sometimes it's a performance goal. Sometimes it's a weight loss goal. Sometimes it's something else entirely. But that is how I would say do it to Emma. I think there's great ideas and or even something as simple as being like okay how many push-ups can I do this week cool I manage six can I do more the next week like even goals like that are quite good as well because they're very simple they're easy to manage and like we like I've just said that you wouldn't be motivated all the time but I think yeah. the other like I I'm in two minds about this question because I like that you're looking forward and you're like how am I going to get over that dip but you're also predicting that that will happen. Like you're, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know at week three, I won't be able to do any more. Yes, you will. Like, and you've got 400 odd people supporting you and backing you and everyone wants the best for each other. So you will get past that. A hundred percent you will. And if you want to track things like your habits, and this might be a good tip for everyone, is like set the things that are really important. So we've kind of outlined them for you. It's your cal. If fat loss is your goal, it's your calories. It's your steps. It's how many workouts you get in. And maybe there's one more. Maybe it's like, I want to read every night or I want to make sure I get to bed by 11 o'clock every single night. You can put whatever you want in, but download a free app. It's called Habit Bowl. There's loads of habit apps you can find, whichever one you want, but you can put in your habits and you can tick them off daily. And it sounds stupid, but people get really in like invested in having green ticks all the way along. Whereas if there's yeah. one cross, it's like, oh, that's that's really annoying. So even things like that, so you can see your progress and you can visually see that if you have ticked all of those boxes that week, that week is a success, even if the scales don't show that. Okay. I agree. And actually, can I just add two things? Mm -hmm. Just really quickly with the scales, everything that I'm saying, I completely stand by. But how I just said that last week I was going from 60 to 64 kg, right, throughout the week, which makes sense as well because I'm on now, in case anyone couldn't tell by my mental. Um, <laughs> so I was going from 60 to 64 kg. That 60 was my lowest weight so far in my fat loss phase. It's my lowest weight, right? So that's a win for me. And we, as we said from the beginning, take your lowest weight. Somebody this morning was like, oh my God, I've gone up 0.7 kg from Friday to Monday. I can't believe I've gained all this weight. And it's like, you haven't gained any weight. The scales fluctuate. You take your lowest weight every week, right? And that is your weight. If that weight doesn't change after two or three weeks, then we know that's a plateau. But don't freak out if it shoots up. It'll come back down again at some point. Um, and, and, and I just want to be clear about that. And what Emma's talking about as well, and I was reading about this last night, which is so interesting that you just started talking about it, the nocebo effect, the nocebo effect, yes. is about telling, yeah. And so powerlifters use it a lot. I, I, I've mentioned it before. I'm like doing like nutrition for a powerlifter right now. And he's, we've managed to get him down from 17 kg to 15 kg and five, uh, 117, sorry, to 115 in five. <laughs> Weeks, I was like, wow, he's 15 kilograms. <laughs> wow, he's, he's a toddler. No, so we've managed to like get him down quite quickly. Um, and he's not losing any strength, which is great. But I was looking into it because obviously your leverage has changed as a power lifter if you're in a smaller body. And they use this, they use they they tell themselves these like mental habits that they're going to get stronger, and more often than not, they bloody do. Like 
it works. Um, so yeah, it's something really interesting to look into. And that positive mental attitude, I'm not a big fan of the secret or any of that stuff, but that positive mental attitude will go a long, long way with your training and your success. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't talk yourself into a plateau or failing or this is where I always stumble. Well, this, this is different. This is not going to happen in this program. Okay. Next question. I don't know whether to say it. Go on. Okay. Are you, are you sure you want to hear it? Yeah. Go for it. Just trying to understand why I've not lost any weight. I know the factors you've mentioned, but they don't really relate to me. So I can't work out if calories are just too high. And she doesn't put what her calories are. No. Right. Okay. So, um, if for example, the, how we've talked about coming in on crazy low calories and having an, uh, we don't want you to stay there. Uh, therefore the scale will likely not move for a little bit while we work you up. Um, if that doesn't apply to you and you've started on the higher end of calories, like that 1800, you can drop a little bit. That is the higher end of the deficit. So we don't mind if you come down a bit, 1700, 1600, that's fine. So that applies. Um, two, if you are not getting your steps in 10 to 12k a day, your knee is not going to be in an optimal position for you to be dropping weight. Please believe us, neat burns more calories than exercise. It is incredibly important you get it in every day, okay? Um, on top of that, I would say check your tracking, check your consistency. Are you 100% sure that you're tracking accurately? Because you'd be surprised how many times people go into week one and they're not. And lastly, this is week one. It will not be the only week you plateau in the next eight weeks. It will happen sometimes two, three, four weeks on the trot. We will tackle it. But this is week one. It's not long enough for you to be like, oh, you know, everything's wrong. No, that's and that's my point. Emma. Yeah. All I would say is review what you've done if you can honestly say because you're only not being honest to yourself you can honestly say you stuck to the plan religiously cool keep sticking to it it is only week one you need to do anything like anything in life this kind of stands for it do it for two weeks before you change anything so I would just say keep going yeah the scales haven't dropped that doesn't surprise me it's only been a week Next question. Eggs are my go-to protein fix in the morning, but I'm worried about eating too many a week due to cholesterol. Is this something I should worry about and stick to a limited number of eggs a week? Uh, I just read a study on this. Do you want me to share? Yeah, I mean, my answer is just no, you shouldn't worry about it. Emma, yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is the correct answer. So the <laughs> cholesterol in your blood, in your body, doesn't really relate to the dietary cholesterol dietary that you eat cholesterol. directly so that's an important point to know now the only people that really would need to worry about this are people who already have cardiovascular disease or some predisposition to that and you would probably know about that yourself so don't worry about that um this study looked at people eating 12 eggs a week over a year so that's like two a day and one day off kind of thing um, and none of them had any increased risks of cardiovascular disease or any negative side effects. And their cholesterol levels weren't any higher. So that seems pretty safe. But now I wouldn't stress about it. And eggs yeah, are I, it, absolutely brilliant. Eggs are a fantastic source of a lot of nutrients. Emma's completely right. The LDL, HDL, which is your blood cholesterol. I know I've got really high blood cholesterol. I'm like, I have all these things. <laughs> Um, and dietary cholesterol are two completely different things. You can see one spike as long as the other stays steady, you're fine. As Emma said, unless you already have some issues uh, with your cholesterol, it is not eating too many eggs. It's not something to worry about. End of discussion. Okay, here's one specifically for you. So it's tips or hacks about pre preparing food for me and my boyfriend. I'm on about 1700 calories. He's on about 3,500 to 4,000 calories a day. So far we've been managing, although sometimes it struggles to hit both. I imagine Chloe has a similar scenario with James and just wondered how she manages to make sure he gets his calories whilst I keep mine low. Okay, so James and I have two meals every day together, breakfast and dinner. Everything in between, he does himself. I, 
who the hell am I kidding? I literally cater to that boy. He is so lucky. But most of the time, like I cook my own food. He has separate food. That's it. But so for breakfast, for example, um, he'll have a big old bowl of granola. I don't know if you know this, but granola will pack a calorie punch. So in his bowl of granola, he's normally hitting about 500 calories alone. Um, I will make a protein mug cake, right? So that for me is like 100 calories. So he has a bowl of something. I have a bowl of something. It's very quick and easy. His takes less than a minute. Mine takes two minutes. Done. Um, then I'll normally have like an egg white omelet with loads of veg, stuff like that, getting my protein in, getting my veg in. Um, and James, I will do him like full whole eggs on like a ciabatta, right, which also packs a calorie punch. So my egg white omelet and all my veg and all of that will probably be like a, an absolute maximum of 150 calories. His whole eggs, which of which he'll normally have three or four, on a buttered, you know, full butter ciabatta, which he'll have, will probably be something more like 500 calories. So at breakfast, he's getting in 1,000 calories, and I'm getting in about 300 right? It's very easy. And both of those things are super quick to do together. Now for dinner, we'll normally do the same thing. We'll have the same meal. But if for him, for example, Emma and I've spoken about how rice will shock you, how calorific it is. I'll get him this like Uncle Ben's microwave rice. That in itself is about 500 calories. With the sirloin steak that I cook him, for example, we'll add on another 500 calories and bang, again, he's had a thousand calories at dinner. For me, I'll get a fillet steak, which is about 200 calories, and I'll do it with a huge salad, which will be about 50 calories. So again, 250. So you find the very similar dinners, and this can apply to like bolognese and chili and, and all those big stews and tray bakes, by the way. And then you basically add carbs and or fats for him and you don't put them in for yourself. And that in that bracket is where you're going to find you can eat the same meals at very different calorie calculations. Now that. <clears throat> um, do you know any food drinks or supplements that can help with bloating? Uh, Simproof probiotic drink. Get on the website, order it. You have a bit before breakfast every day and you're good to go. Emma. <laughs> I, I mean, that sounds great. So I don't have anything to add. I don't know any that like particularly do. I know that things like just um, peppermint tea. And I think what, what almost annoys me about this is that pe some people really suffer with IBS or bloating or like painful, but what you really need to do isn't look for a supplement. Like you need to write food diary out, which you're doing at the moment already, if you're tracking on my fitness pal. But on top of that, you need to make a diary of your symptoms. And then you need to put these two together. Okay, I had this. That's when I felt my worst after that. Is that a pattern that's occurring? Is that a food that actually maybe doesn't suit me very well? I think that's going to be the best thing to do. Supplements might help a little bit, but you're almost like treating the symptom, not the cause. There's a reason that you're bloating. It might be because, do you know what? Sometimes, and I used to have really bad bloating, more as like a child. Or like, actually, I say child, like probably until I was like 18 or something. And I realized it was because I was eating so fast that like, I think there was like air in my stomach. It was ah. so strange. And you could, cause I was so lean as well. You could see it like this big, like, it was very strange, but anyway, it might be that like sit down and make sure you're slowing down and having your meal, like have a glass of water with your meal and just try, try that. But also that diary thing, that's what you need to do. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to say this comment because it's nice. She says, no question. I feel your pain when you've been asked a question that has been on the notes or has been on the podcast or in another post. Lol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, quick fire one. My water intake isn't great. How much should I be aiming to drink minimum? Uh, for a woman, minimum, I would say three liters a day. Um, so even if you just get like one of these, like this is 600. So I have, hmm, hang on. <laughs> I have five of these a day. So I'll have like one at breakfast, uh, one in between breakfast and lunch, one at lunch, one in between lunch and dinner, one at dinner and I'm done. Um, and that is my advice, Emma. Yeah, I think just drink to thirst. Make sure that something is always available, though, because I think a lot of the time we're so lazy that we're like, oh, I'm a bit thirsty, but nah, I'll just wait yeah. until I don't know when. But yeah, if there's always something there, then you end up just sort of drinking it anyway. So make sure that you always have a water bottle near you. 
and your thirst will increase the more you drink as well like it's kind of like your body readapts to it and readjusts to it but just to anybody who is increasing their water intake please be aware that we want you to salt your food get your sodium in or it's just you need both both need to balance out each other like james hates salt hates high sodium foods that just can't do it it's like pounding liters of water all day every day so dehydrated couldn't figure it out until all of a sudden matt lovell his uh one of his nutritionists was like are you salting your food and i was like oh my god this is it this is the problem anyway yeah because you can get like this is this is more of a problem with endurance athletes who like let's say you run a marathon you sweat a whole load when you sweat you're you're losing electrolytes you're also losing salt um and but you're putting in a load of water and that balance needs to be right and you can get what's called hyponatremia which is like basically the wrong balance of that which can be really like it can put you in a coma so like really really bad so do make sure that if you are someone who either sweats a lot or really like avoid salt so the the thing about adding salt to food is sometimes it doesn't need it like if you're using more processed foods there's often salt like a lot of salt already in there somewhere there's a lot of sodium in eggs Mm. yeah so make sure that you're not like overdoing it but I also think salt gets a bad name, doesn't it? Like people are like, oh, oh you yeah. don't want to put salt on that. And actually you you do need you some. You do. Yeah, it's really important. Exactly like Emma said, if you're an athlete, which obviously I don't think many or anyone in our group is, but um, if you're an athlete, if you train a lot, if you take it seriously, it's really hugely important. I used to think he was putting salt in it, but he wasn't. He was putting BCAAs in it. Anyway, when I made that distinction, I was like, okay, let's remove this forever <laughs> and do this from now on. <laughs> yeah but a lot of these sports drinks like if you drink lucasade or something it tends to have electrolytes in yeah it, so you'll be okay okay quick fire one i was wondering if i can still do a 24-hour fast if i wanted to will it matter that i'm not having any protein in that time and would you advise me not to work out that day thanks Uh, If you want to do a 24 hour fast once a week, that's absolutely fine. I would please ask that you start it after breakfast, a very high protein breakfast, please. Um, And that you break your fast uh, with another high protein breakfast the next day. It's actually a good thing to do a 24 hour fast. You will downregulate things like um, mTOR and IGF-1. It will have a really good effect on your body, but you do want to sandwich that with a high protein intake. You might also, when you break the fast, want to look into more of a shake um, so that you know you're you don't completely shock your digestive system um but i would want you to do it breakfast to breakfast protein to protein um and i'm fine with you doing that and yeah in an ideal world i would have you doing it on a rest day i really 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 would um emma yeah i agree if you're gonna do it do it on a rest day um that is all i have to add on that one uh okay quick fire recipes for protein powder i hate the stuff and need to make it more palatable I normally mix it into yogurt, also add some flavour drops, that's quite nice, like 0% fat Greek yogurt that has a good protein kick in it as well, so you'll be getting a lot. There are loads of, um, you've put up recipes, haven't you? Your protein mug cake. Yeah, so okay, just really quick, there is a protein, there's protein ice cream on the new, uh, on the new meal plan Pl- protein mug cake okay first of all it might be the protein that you're using so the only two that i can e- i've ever been able to stomach are a phd diet whey which is great to cook with i don't know why but it is um and grenade hydro six those are the two the only two i've ever found that i can handle the rest of them i do not like them um and they don't cook well so a lot of the time i'll give people recipes they'll be having my protein which is not great and uh it, the recipe doesn't work everything falls apart don't do it don't use it um so those are the two i recommend protein mug cake i have it pretty much every day it's my sweet tooth fix high protein it's great low calorie it's one scoop a dash of milk you want a really thick batter like kind of like blubber when you shake it right mm. put it in the microwave for two <laughs> put it in the microwave for two or three minutes using the two that products that i've mentioned otherwise it might not work take it out a little squirt of, of, of sweet freedom choc choc which is like 20 calories there you go you could do the same mix with an egg the egg will bind it and then you can make pancakes or a little waffle iron you can get them so cheap now and like crappy little stores a little waffle iron um and then i would also say 
you can make really nice like milkshakes with them especially if you use ice banana oats things that really thicken it up um and it will taste like a genuine milkshake if you put the good the right stuff in it um and yeah there's going to be more meal plans every week so you guys will get more and while we're on this graduates your tray bakes meal plan will be up in a couple of hours i'm just finalizing some final macro counts awesome Okay, next question. I need to increase my neat. I'm sitting at my laptop most of the day. How can I be more creative with achieving steps? Okay, if you want to, and this goes for everyone, especially if you think you might be working from home for a while, I would invest in a standing desk. And some of them are ridiculously expensive, but I bought one and I'm pretty sure it was 50-ish pounds off Amazon. And you Good. like it sits on top of your desk. Like I'm on it right now. I can't show you it sits on top of your desk and it's just like a hydro hydrolyzed hydro I don't know it has little things you can pull it up to whatever height you want but you don't have to buy a completely new desk and revamp your whole room like you can and also if you're like right I normally use a dining room table cool you use this your standing desk during the day put it down put it to the side done you can now have your dinner on it so it's really useful and I think that will probably won't increase your step count that much but it means you're not sitting for the whole day but it also means that if you do want to sit you just put it down and you can sit as well so I think actually that's probably a quite good investment for some people the other way like there are so many ways you can get steps if you want to do there's like so many free sort of steps slash aerobic classes online or Zumba if you wanted to do something like that you could that gets you about 5,000 steps if you do a full class um otherwise like i've had clients that march on the spot watching tv you can go out for walks obviously i don't know what else do you have i'll call like my people who i quite like to speak to or need to speak to on like a basically daily basis so if i'm not with james james my mom my dad my friends and i'll just walk around the kitchen table round and round and round i go before i know i've done 900 steps in a phone call you do that like twice a day it's a great way to get your step count up so that's a good one i also make sure that i'm never sitting down for longer than an hour but that's also for, for me for my mental sanity i'll get up i'll go make a cup of tea maybe i'll wipe down the kitchen from where i made breakfast that morning i'll go upstairs and like i don't know get some stuff to paint my nails with later while I'm watching TV. I mean, obviously I never paint my nails, but you know, sometimes I'll do a little bit on my toenails um, when it, when the weather's nice. You know, just like give yourself stuff to do. And yeah, this would really be my advice. My advice. My advice. Nah. Okay, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that was really useful for you. Okay, arms. I've been obsessed with how lean ballerina's arms look. And after losing body fat, would you achieve this look with heavy reps or low reps with lighter weights? Sorry, heavy weights with low reps or high reps with lighter weights? Okay, so, um, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> Where to start? The way I do, I even saw this. There is no such thing as long, lean muscle. This isn't a thing, okay? Your muscle is your muscle, and what your muscle bellies look like are completely subjective to the person so if someone has long lean muscle um it's usually because you know say if they're like a model they've got a long lean structure and that's how their body is if so and you know uh mesomorphs mesomorphs i really don't even know how to pronounce it <laughs> she said after nine years of working in the industry um if you uh, we tend to have we love it that i'm just lumping myself in that group we tend to have like more shorter fuller muscle bellies um also what it will depend of is uh, depend on is the length of time with which you've been training but essentially where i'm going with this is that it has nothing to do with um how you train muscle is muscle is muscle it will look different on everyone and how lean you look is about how much body fat you lose before the muscle will then start to show through so it's about fat loss and it is about your genetics i'll tell you now there are two areas of my body i have been tiny very low body fat managed to get myself into a size six which for me is like i mean like a, a miracle right and i have never ever had ballerina arms skinny arms thin arms never i'm not built like that it's not how i look and it's not um, it's not how my body is it's not how my muscles are and also i've never ever ever gotten rid of my cellulite i've decreased it significantly but it's never completely gone like if i move in a way i it's there um so i would just say better i mind it, it's usually about genetics emma 
Yeah, I think, okay, with this question, and obviously it's not all ballerinas, but you're actually looking at someone who is, one, like an elite athlete, ballerinas train a ridiculous amount. And two, a lot of ballerinas have like, especially the ones right at the top, the women, have almost pushed themselves or been so lean that they actually haven't even gone through puberty in some ways. Like some of them have never had a period. Like my point is they're not healthy individuals. And this happens a lot, even in the fitness industry or you'll look at a model and you'll be like, oh, I wish I could look like that. They look so happy or they look so fit. They're not. A lot of them aren't. A lot of them are ill. Like this, it's not something you should particularly aim for. And just because we've put it on a pedestal as beauty and, and you like the way it looks, I don't think that is something that people should aim for, is that they are literally so lean. Like, that's why they look like that. And it's an amazing feat in some respects. But actually, they're probably restricting themselves so much to maintain that kind of physique that I don't think it's a healthy goal for, for a lot of us to look towards. I that would agree. Be, yeah I agree I think you look at any professional athlete whether it's a physique athlete a bodybuilder a fitness model or even a rugby player a boxer an MMA fighter these are not particularly physically healthy individuals what they can do is largely well it all starts and ends with genetics you know you have to be of a genetic you know type to be able to become an international professional athlete that in and of itself is it's almost impossible for joe public to to achieve right you have to have a huge backlog of experience which will most likely be beating the shit out of your body in some way shape or form whether it's dietary like ballerinas or whether it's physicality like rugby players these individuals might be specimens phenomenally impressive and, and that's a hundred percent true but they are most definitely not super duper duper healthy and I know when I look my best on shoot day I feel like shit and not just on that day but in the weeks leading up to it and the weeks after it is hard um to get to that kind of elite level and yeah it might not be something that, that you'll ever achieve and and that is not that's not a, to put a downer on it. it it probably shouldn't be something that you necessarily want to achieve but Emma I love that point that was great yeah definitely um okay how to manage meal timings when working evenings 4 p.m to night midnight i think it's really hard for a lot of shift workers and i like take my hat off to you i it's slightly easier and i don't know if this is the case for this individual if you're like i always work 4 p.m to midnight because you sort your life around that you sort your circadian rhythm sort of adjust to that a little bit you sleep at a certain time you're awake at a certain time you eat at certain times of day fine if you're someone, and I know this is a lot of people, who they do four days on night shift and then they're off for four days and then they're on day shift and then they go back to night shift, that's really hard. And it's really hard on your body because it doesn't know what it's getting and when it's getting it. I think the best thing to do is to plan, like plan forward. So if you know you're on night shift, okay, when am I going to get my training in? What meals am I going to have? When am I going to have them? And I know, again, you have to be flexible because that might not always happen. Maybe you're a nurse and you don't get a break in your whole shift, which unfortunately happens a hell of a lot more than it should. So you don't get time to eat during that shift. If that's the case, make sure you also have things like a protein bar that you can just go to. The other thing that often happens with people who work shifts is they're like, I had the longest, most stressful shift. I didn't get a break. I'm emotionally drained you're on your way back from work and you stop at Tesco. That is the worst time to go shopping because you will not buy, you won't make good decisions then. You've just had a full shift of making really hard decisions. Always plan ahead. So have something at home in the freezer, in the fridge that you can just grab, get out. I know I'm having this when I get home. Great. Then you've made that decision already and just try and stick to that. Don't go shopping after a, a really long hard shift. Um, so yeah, I think my tip would be planning. What's yours? Yeah. Any? I agree. Plan it, and um, yeah, I'm, everything Emma just said, I'm I'm on board with. It's really hard for you guys, and um, I I feel for you. Uh, but it's absolutely doable. As Emma said, you just have to go in with a plan and execute it. And I and actually, 
your, your body will readjust and readapt once you start to get those habits and those balls rolling, not only mentally, but physiologically as well. Um, as Emma's talked about before, you'll find you start to feel hungry at the right time. You're wanting the, you know, the same foods and yeah, everything she said, plan for it and you'll be fine. Okay. I've lost weight previously. Five stone. Wow. Well done. Wow. Um, but as you know, it's not the losing, it's the keeping it off that matters. Absolutely. Will there be maintenance and adherence support further down the line? Yeah, that's exactly why we created the grads. So you can, once you've lost the weight you want to lose, like some of the grads are still losing weight. Some of them have decided they've lost weight. Now their goal is maintenance. Um, so yeah, you can stay on and we will keep supporting you. Absolutely. And it's good yeah, that you're already you, thinking about that. Even if that. you don't come back, for, we, you'll have doc, we give documents for everybody when they leave anyway. So Okay, I'm going to do a couple more quick fire ones and then we will wrap up because it's a lot. Okay. And we've almost done an hour. Okay, quick fire. Um, what do you do with tracking when you have no idea how many calories are in something, i.e. someone else has cooked it? Um, this is a skill. It's called eyeballing. It's uh, after a long period of tracking this is your a own skill. food protein. It's a skill. Um it, after a long period of checking your own food, proteins, fats, carbs, meals out, meals in, da, da 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 you can pretty much look at a plate of food and be like, I reckon that's cooked in butter, oil, oh, that's mint, oh, that, you know, that, oh, it tastes like it might be 5%, 15%, that's probably chopped in tomatoes, that's probably a chopped red onion. You can pretty much look at it and know exactly what is in it and what you're putting in. And there's nothing wrong with guesstimating as well. If you're a bit off or a bit over, a bit under, always try and aim to be a bit over just to be safe. If you're a bit over, a bit under, it's fine. It's fine. You know, eyeballing is great, but it is something that comes with time um, and you will get better at it. Uh, but I would say, yeah, look at it like that. Try and deconstruct the ingredients and then put it in. Uh, a good thing to do as well, by the way, guys, is that if you're with people and you don't want to be antisocial, take a photo of the food on your food of the food on your phone. You know, and you can like blow smoke up the cook's ass. Like it looks so great. I'm gonna put it on Instagram later. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> then go go home later and track it and delete the photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good one. And you can absolutely do it. The thing is. If you're not, especially if you're like, yeah, okay, three times a week, someone else cooks a meal, I don't know what's in it. Fine, guesstimate it. If fat loss is your goal, always overestimate a little bit. Um, I have a client who cannot track anything because she's working on a cruise ship and everything is cooked by a chef, which means that none of her food she knows about. But she, like exactly what Chloe said, she just looks at it, says, okay, I think it's about this. This is what it would be on my fitness pal. Maybe I'm going to add 10, 20% on that because it's probably cooked in oil and I'm trying to lose body fat. And the thing is, with all of this, if you're doing that and you think, okay, well, actually, it's been two weeks, I've not lost weight, you're obviously not estimating enough. So you increase yeah. that estimate. And that's kind of how we played it. Like, th this fat loss game doesn't have to be exact. My fitness pal is like, just, it's, basically just come on the scene like I'd say five years ago people weren't using it people still lost weight five years ago it's mm -hmm. portion sizes it's what you eat it's looking at things you could lose weight without tracking you just need to be aware of what you're eating and make sure that yeah. you're not eating things that are too calorie dense or going over your calories okay next yeah. question does it matter if I use bottled water or tap water no not at all no. If you do two workouts on one day, would you count that as two days or just one? Doesn't matter. Like we, it, you'd count, okay, so I've done five workouts this week. One day I did two because I had to squeeze them in. That's fine. You've done five workouts in the week. It's not about the days you do. This is a really important point to make about um, calories as well. A couple of people have been like, yeah. I stuck to my calories for six days. Okay, what was your calorie average? Was it over your calorie intake? Because that's why you've not lost weight. Like all the calories that we've set you. It doesn't matter the days. You can be good for six days a week and still not get results because on the seventh day you're, you're blowing it. So it's not the days, it's the averages. That's what we want to know. Yeah. And with workouts, the only time where we'll be like, no, no, we don't want you to train twice in one day is when we're in the gym and we're talking about like really lifting that's it but with these workouts you can absolutely do two in one day and that and you know again it's calories burned it's your weekly average so it's okay emma 
what do green ticks mean on my fitness pal does it indicate something is more likely to be accurate uh is, is it it's just um it's been uh, updated or loaded up by the company's nutritionist or something like that it's like I more think, official yeah. it's like having a, a blue tick on instagram it's actually yeah. chloe madeley oh yeah <laughs> um okay quick fire more meal ideas and meals that can provide more than one portion to prep Warm up slash cool down either side of workouts. Do we do we provide our stats for accountability and feedback? Um, um, okay. With meal ideas, guys, the food bible has a whole list of proteins, fats, carbs, right? That you, of, with with which you can make up your breakfast, lunch, dinner. We've got eggs. We've got Greek yogurt. We've got corn. We've got tofu. We've got oats. We've got rice. It's all in there. <laughs> If you look at the meal plan, I upload different meal plans every week for meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. That's great if you want to cook those exact recipes, but it's more uh, for, for all of you. It's like a guide, inspiration. Ooh, something French. Ooh, something Mexican. It's just inspiration and a guide to work from, and it gives you a rough idea of, of, of kind of protein, fat, carb, macros per meal, and what that would look like in, in those calories. Emma. Boom. Okay. Um... Oh, a few things I want to say about this, right? Meal ideas. Chloe puts up amazing ideas, but also Google. Like, it has unlimited recipes. Do you know what's really, really good? And I often use, often, whenever I actually cook, is BBC Good Food. There's, like, yes! so, so many recipes for under 500 calories. Or you yeah. can add the portion. Like, this is asking for more than one portion to prep. That doesn't make it, like, if it's one portion there, just divide it by more however many you want it's absolutely fine um so it, that has so many recipes you must find some that you like and, and the tray other thing... bakes as well that's something i'm doing for the grads now it's a tray bake file so you can do and i've said to them all of these calories are served two so like everything's anywhere between six to eight hundred calories right to serve two people so you just have half um but i literally say in big bold letters feel free to quadruple them and feel, feed the whole family. It's not yeah. hard to do. Anyway, yeah. go on. Um, the other thing I was going to say, which is quite a, a useful resource, if you're like, okay, I kind of want, I want a set meal plan to follow. Go to eatthismuch.com and you can put in like, oh, 1600 calories is my goal. You can say how much protein you want. You can say if you're vegetarian, vegan, meat eater, whatever you want to eat more mediterranean diet style you can put in all of this stuff paleo is even there and it will spit you out meal plans like mm. this is partly why we don't do it like we don't want you to stick to meal plans if you want a guide there there's loads of stuff that you can use for that if you want that so if you're looking for more and more meal plans that you just want something to stick to or get, that at least gives you some ideas and gives you a guide of of what you can do with your calories, that's quite a good website to look at. I love that. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it's quite good. What have I been doing? Old Muggins <laughs> over here writing a recipe book from scratch. I'm like, Jesus, could have just copied and plagiarized the whole website. <laughs> can you imagine? My publishers would look at my sock, guys. <laughs> oh my lord, that's bad. Unacceptable behavior. Anyway. Oh god. Um. Okay, this is quite a long-winded question, so I'm just going to break it down. Essentially, it comes down to if you have weights at home, use them. You've yes. you've got so many options. Like some of Chloe's workouts have weights in them. I've given a whole gym workout that you can adapt to home if you do, if you don't have certain things. So if you have weights, you should be using them. So yeah, can... but also we have asked you guys, you guys have already put all of your uh, equipment beneath the announcement post where I asked what weights you had. As expected, it was exactly the same as the grads had. Um, so we will start uploading some weighted exercises as of next week, week three. But we'll also keep just full body stuff in there as well for those of you that don't have anything. So don't worry if you don't, but a set of dumbbells can go a long way. Same with kettlebells. Okay. Like we have quite a lot to go through we've got wednesday and friday 
And I, yeah. I don't mean to be rude, but instinct would tell me that a lot of the questions are going to be similar. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're a third of the way through. Yes! Woo! Okay, so we will come back to these questions. We will try and cover them. If they've already been covered, like then obviously we won't we won't go over them again. So make sure you do keep up to date with the podcast. Another way to get steps in, put the podcast on, keep stepping until the podcast is finished. That's a whole hour of stepping around. Chloe, yeah. do we have any on the any like urgent ones on the live feed or anything? We have a couple from the grads, which I think we can answer on Wednesday. Um, I also, I'll speak to you about maybe fitting in a couple more this week um, mm -hmm. if we need to, because I don't want to get everybody's questions answered. Yeah. Um, grads, just a note to the grads. I I love it that you're like, you guys are like off to the races and it's fantastic. Please do keep tagging Emma and I in your questions. We are still here to help you. Um, so you absolutely don't, don't feel scared. Um, and also, you know, it's quite it's quite a novelty to have people who are already in into their like what eleventh week of this with us. So do tag us. And um yeah, Emma and I will see if we can squish in any more this week. We might not be able to, we might, we'll try. And if not, we'll see you on Wednesday at twelve.